back and moving into our second conversation for today another very interesting one uh, and we are here to find out more about the work of the IOM in Belize we have the head of office Diana Locke with us and the topic of conversation is migration and the status of migrants in the country good yes. morning good morning good morning thanks yeah. thanks for having me here yes um, if I could start up by saying that we, you saw the video that we aired earlier yes. um, regarding Mr. Pedro, and he's just one story of a vast range of experiences that we've met in the field. Yeah. So Mr. Pedro um, is a migrant who came to Belize over 25 years ago um, when we did mm -hmm. our hub in the first hub we had in February of last year in Bella Vista. We encountered him. Sad to say, um, he was following up on his permanent resident application, which he thought he had filed, but he had a receipt for $100 that he paid somebody and there was never an application. Mm. So we looked at his case. We found out that he was in a legal status for almost 20 something years. And when he got injured, as the story indicated, he then um, lost his status because he had to retire on, mm. on medical grounds and he's then collecting his social security pension but he no longer had a legal status because his work permit had expired and so um, that said um, Mr. Pedro found out the hard way and we then t we were really sorry about his case and we, we kind of adopted it at the office yeah. mm -hmm. and then our donor decided that they were going to f step in and assist um, and so they then allowed us to use the funds that we have to help him to get a legal status with the kindness of the director of immigration she reviewed his case and she allowed him to get a dependence permit on his son and we have now completed his entire application for permanent residence it's in and it's waiting to be processed so mr pedro after 25 years is going to probably become a permanent resident um, and this is the situation that we find for many people in the industries with work permits that they've been here for a significant amount of time yeah working in those industries um, i think earlier you all were talking about foreign exchange earning mm -hmm. foreign exchange for belize over all these years making mm -hmm. their contribution and it's not only in the banana industry but it's banana citrus sugar um, in the spanish lookout area where you have a lot of these people that that support industries and so um, migrants are important in any country mm -hmm. so let's, the, let's, uh -huh. before we go any further because i do want to make a <laughs> distinction i know our viewers um, very often there is a amalgamation of, of definitions yes. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important that we, we address it as early yes. as possible, especially given the fact that there was a recent situation with refugees um, in the country. What's the difference between a migrant and a refugee? The term migrant includes refugees. Yes. The refugees are a segment. So a migrant is any person who is not living in his or her country of birth. So, for example, if I was born in Jamaica and I'm now here with a permanent, if I'm a citizen of Belize, that changes. Mm -hmm. But if I am a, a, a permanent resident, I'm still considered a migrant. However, I must clarify for the international standard, when they're doing censuses or, or, or reports, a migrant is looked, looked at as any person who was not born in that country, irre irre irrespective of the status that you currently hold. Mm. So when you're counting um, migrants um, from, let's say, for, for example, from Udessa, they look at your place of birth. And so a migrant may have transitioned to a national and that would not be picked up because it's there. So you, you're looking at a large number. So mm -hmm. migration, migrants on a whole is the big picture. And then you have different elements of, you have labor migrants, you have um, tourism, as you get up on a plane and you travel, you become a, a migrant. Mm -hmm. um, you have those persons who, um, for ma purposes of marriage would, mm -hmm. would move. Um, you have persons who, for work, as I mentioned before, whether it's be seasonal or agricultural work. And a refugee now is a, a person who is moving from his or her place of origin to another place seeking refuge and protection. Mm -hmm. And so they are a smaller um, portion of that group of persons that in the bigger picture. Yes. So they, they, they're seeking a status based on fair prosecution, um, clearly out def defined outlined terms outlined for them. Yeah, they're running to safety. To safety. To safety right. and hoping a country will accept them. Right. Um, I wanted to go to go back to to the ideals of um, how we accept migrants in in Belize, right? This this culture of accepting migrants in Belize. Mm -hmm. I like that you you talked about how as soon as you move, get on a plane, and you go somewhere exactly. else, you are a migrant, which is 
the correct definition exactly. of, of migration. Mm -hmm. um, why? What is the the process mm -hmm. of of uh, obtaining permanent residence in Belize? Why Why did it take him twenty five years to be able to to move? And because he has been contributing, like you said, just as many other migrants have in this country for so long. Why does it take so long for them to move out of a work permit into a permanent residency, into a citizenship? It's really very simple. Lack of information. Mm. Okay. And, and navigating the services. I think sometimes even um, Belizeans who would contact me and say, I need to renew my passport. What do I need to do? It's just that simple. And they're tra battling with the language difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, people have offered, like in his case, they offered to help him and it didn't work out because someone took $100 from him but never completed an application form. And so it's, it's lack of information. That is one of the things that IOM has been focusing on um, through the Integrated Response on Migration Project, which is funded by USAID. Um, they're focusing strictly on um, providing services to people like Mr. Pedro or any migrant in Belize who wants information and services to follow through on getting their status regularized. Um, we have been focusing through four of our hubs. We have four hubs located in Bella Vista. Um, we have one in Bella Vista run by Humana. We have one in Cayo run by Red Cross. We have the YWCA in Belize City. And we have the first one that we opened up is the Child Development Foundation in Belmopan. And so um, those four offices have been working within the communities that they, they um, operate to help people to one, to get information through another one of our programs and also to provide services. Yeah. So they're going to be very busy in the next few months as they continue to help people through the amnesty process. Yeah. They have been working with people who are entitled to a status under the laws of Belize and that status um, would be either through marriage through permanent residence, through either a work permit or permanent residence, through being a minor who lived in Belize for from the time of the, they were a minor minor child for ten years or more, the law provides for that. So we have been focusing in assisting people who met the criteria under the law but just didn't know what to do. Yeah. And now with the amnesty, we're going to expand that to helping people who qualify under the criteria for the amnesty. Yeah. So we're um, going to be working along with the immigration ministry um, to go out and into the community. We have done that already. We had been to. Uh, six eight communities we had visited eight communities um, in different parts more in the south of belize and we had encountered a lot of people approximately 1000 a little over 1000 persons in our mobile hubs and we saw from that exercise that the majority of people that we encountered during that period of time were persons who were entitled to a status in belize i would say roughly about 60 percent um, uh, out of that 60%, there was a the significant number were people married to Belizeans. Mm -hmm. They were living in really remote areas and mm -hmm. couldn't be bothered to take that trip to come in, mm -hmm. to bring their documents, to get the turnaround and, and, and transportation, to get to the location, to do this, to, to get themselves documented. Mm -hmm. And so they just live in their community and kind of happy with their family. Some of them had like 10 children. They were yeah. here for 60 years. Um, we saw a lot of that, particularly in the South. That's interesting. And so, um, they're out of the number that we have under the amnesty that's disclosed, I think a fairly large number of persons are persons who would normally have been entitled to a status. Who would qualify. Who would qualify for a status in Belize under the current laws. Yeah. Not even under the amnesty. There will be a significant portion, though, that will qualify under the amnesty. And so um, we're, we're definitely willing to work to help those persons come forward, get their documentation prepared. Um, we do have the ability for those people who are really in vulnerable positions um, to help them to get, actually pay to get their documents done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the services that are currently provided by the hubs include uh, paying for birth certificates, foreign, foreign birth certificates, and, and in some cases, um, local birth certificates for people who need that in the application process. We pay for passports, foreign passports. Mm -hmm. We pay for, um, if you need a debt certificate or you need the translation of a document, we do translations. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have in, in, in cases paid for the medical, for, for persons who are applying for, um, for, for the status. We've um, not so far paid for the police record, but we've paid for medical, which is a substantial cost. So um, we have costed the services and we have put aside, there's a budget. Mm -hmm. And so all of these hubs offer that to people who are really vulnerable and cannot afford to pay for it. Let, let me just come back to the core of the issue here. And I guess essentially the objective of the work of the IOM. Why is it important 
um, that this population of persons who are essentially undocumented are able to seek some sort of status in the country if they're eligible? It's important for us because we, we our primary mandate is to ensure safe and orderly migration yeah. um, and dignified migration. So a lot of our programs are aimed at helping people whether they want to leave or whether they want to stay. Um, I can tell you a little bit quickly about the other programs that we do and how they impact each other. Um, the largest program we're running right now is the Western Hemisphere program, which is operational. And that entails 18 activities and a lot of capacity building. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of training um, on human trafficking, understanding human trafficking, identifying human trafficking. We're offering a diploma program at Galen University. Under WHP, we've provided support to the Labor Department. We're providing support to the Ministry of Human Development, um, with their legislation, updating their legislation. Um, we are doing a digitization project with the Ministry of Immigration, the Nationality and Passport Department. And then we have the Assisted Voluntary Return Program that you might have heard of. This is the program that helps people who no longer want to stay in Belize to leave. Mm -hmm. So in September of last year, we got permission from the government to assist migrants who were in Belize in an irregular status, um, did not qualify for anything but that they can leave without any penalties. Mm -hmm. And so we have been taking people back in that process. We've taken back persons who are irregular. We've taken back asylum seekers who no longer wish to stay here, but to return to their country of origin. We've taken back a significant amount of minors, unaccompanied minors, mm -hmm. um, that, that number is growing. And we see that happening increasing. And so that program basically took back, since we started to do this in June of last, June of 2020, we've taken back about 239 persons they're provided with support in their country when they return so to help them integrate that they don't want to leave again mm -hmm. that program and the whp um, western hemisphere program is funded by the prm department of um, Bureau population of refugee and migration in the u.s so yeah. those are two of that and then of course the irm program that i talked about they are also focused on data collection yeah. statistics trying to help we're doing projects with the sib we recently had the analysis of the migration data from the 2010 census we're waiting for the results of a labor force survey that was done in September, but that had a new component for migration. So we're going to get some more information there. Mm -hmm. And so the, the IRM is focused on trying to help government um, get data moving. To maybe really know the picture. Right, yeah. to know right, the picture is. And of course, we're working with the government to help them to uh, set up a migration policy. The framework for migration policy. I want to get so to that. But before <laughs> so that we get there, because I think the migration one policy the projects. Is, is, is key. Um, mm -hmm. But... How many migrants would you say are currently in the country? Documented. We really, well, <laughs> well documented we, don't and have, documented, yeah. we don't have that specific information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can only guess. Best guess. <laughs> I, migrants, the, the formula that is used puts it at about 60,000. Mm -hmm. And remember that includes both legal and regular and irregular migrants. So um, it could be that and the by number regular of regular and irregular. You regular mean means those who have a status. A no, no. Regular means that the process is complete. They're 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 entitled to remain here as a permanent resident, maybe a okay. citizen, whatever. Um, and then you have um, those who are irregular. Mm -hmm. And then of course in that category you have those who are entitled to a status and haven't done anything, and then those who are not entitled to anything, but maybe entitled to something now that the amnesty is here. And so um, those are the figures that we're trying to help government to establish. Okay. So <laughs> right. coming back to it, though, because there's a core issue here, and I don't want us to just brush past it. And that's the stigma mm -hmm. that exists in the country um, when we talk about migrants. Really interesting. And we, I think it's always uh, thrown around how we uh, use words like expats in some cases mm -hmm. and then that other word that we try not to say mm -hmm. um, for for migrants from from Central American countries so they do the same thing they move from one country to exactly. another hoping to reasons. be able yeah for different mm -hmm. reasons hoping to be able to establish themselves in Belize how do you work on reducing the stigma that exists in the country because a lot of times you what you hear from people is a fear that somehow access and resources may be taken away from them and given to others who weren't born here? Um, I think first of all, we need to recognize if these persons are making a contribution and if they're not. Mm -hmm. And I think in most cases they are. 
I would say in a, the majority of cases, they're making a contribution. They're working in our agricultural sector, um, and we need to recognize those things. Once we're accepting of those things, the contribution that they make, I think the attitude will change. And I think it's because people don't know, right? Mm -hmm. This process didn't start last week or last month or last year. This process started way back when we started an economic citizenship program. Yeah. We still had things going on. This was in the 80s. We had refugees coming in in the 90s. Um, in, in the ni late 90s, we had um, other programs that were on. Mm -hmm. And so the government in its own um, policies encouraged migration to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And so I in my former life, I, I saw what happened from the time I returned to Belize in 1992 to where we are today. <laughs> so I have a pretty good idea of what <laughs> what has happened. It mm -hmm. just didn't happen. It, it's mm -hmm. been happening from way back then, but nobody said anything. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, we're getting up and we're speaking about it, which is good. Mm -hmm. But we also um, need to look at the, the positive side of it and not necessarily the negative side. Yeah. When I read files in the immigration department as, um, as the director at the time for permanent residents, yes, indeed, there was a large number of persons from, the, um, from Central America that applied and they didn't have a whole lot of resources. Mm -hmm. But there were some files in there that I read that I was extremely impressed about with the business skills that you saw in preparation for, for businesses and how they had all the documentation. So mm -hmm. there are people who are given the opportunity can turn their life around. I want to say to Belizeans, let us look at ourselves. Um, we go across to the United States and we do some of the same things that they're doing here. And we do it for the same reasons. So let us not crucify those persons that are here. Um, many people have them cutting the grass. Mm -hmm. They're doing work within the homes. Um, and if we really stop and we, we look back at what we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, we are using some of the skills of these services of these persons. We just don't want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we, we have to be mindful. It, it has to be managed and it must be balanced. Yeah. I, I would be the first one to say that. It has to be managed and it has to be balanced. I'm, I'm pleased, IOM, and personally from my point, pleased with the fact that we're doing the amnesty because after the amnesty is over, things have to change. Mm -hmm. And that would be a good starting point to mm -hmm. make those changes. So I, I want to say to Belizeans, um, yes, things are changing, but and unfortunately, it's not only in Belize, it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. So let us try to get the best out of it. Let us work with the government as private citizens. You can have your say. You can ask them to do certain things. You can ask for information and let us together work to make this better. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to encourage people. Um, have you seen a shift in, in the openness? Um, I, I, the, the calls I get from Belizeans who are trying to help migrants surprises me, mm. right? Because I, I had a friend who contacted me a while ago and I saw her recently and she contacted me because somebody who has been working in her community cutting the grass in their community for 30 years eventually got picked up by the police and everybody was up in arms. So they managed to, to get him released. And I said to her, this is probably what you can do. Go to immigration after 30 years, all of you, he's working for all of you. You can demonstrate that he has a right to be considered for regularization. That's the determination of the Department of Immigration. But they never got around to doing it. So I saw her recently and she says, we never got to finish it, but the amnesty, we're hoping to take advantage of the amnesty. So <laughs> there are people out there who are seeing um, situations that they can assist people. And, and these are people who are in your community. Um, so I, that's that's uh -huh. from the, Belize, the Belizean side. Mm -hmm. um, what from about the migrant population that you do encounter? Mm -hmm. Is there a level of fear? Um, yes, definitely there is a level of fear. They're, they're afraid of coming out from where they live to access the services because of the police and the, the perception of the police treatment and immigration treatment. Yes. There is that. And so this is why we were happy to go into those communities to kind of take the information into them and to try to provide some support services. There is the fear. Um, there is the lack of finances. Um, people um, generally feel the language barrier is another major issue and IOM is trying along with many other persons that we're discovering 
to offer English as a second language yeah. and we're trying to ramp that up a bit more so that these people can properly integrate. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is after the amnesty is over to look at the data and to see how through IRM programs we can provide more services so that these people can integrate to speak the language if they need if they're operating a little business and they need a little help and guidance in the right direction to make it better so that they can contribute to business taxes or whatever it is the trade okay. license whatever um, we're looking at plans and programs to do things like that to help and we're not the only agency there there are other UN agencies that focus on like UNICEF for example on children how do they how do they assist children and families yeah. so it's it's not just um iom it's a yeah. it's a wide range of persons and we're really hoping that we can get data out there that people can use to make informed decisions and to provide more help so yeah. i i i um according to you um i want to hear your perspective right? this is a question <laughs> for you not head of office of iom um <coughs> i hear you addressing the lesions you asked you talk about the stigma and so forth so then what makes you a Belizean? What's ma what makes me what a Belizean? What makes you a, a Belizean? What makes a person a Belizean? By birth. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I need to clarify too. We talk about migrants. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a migrant family, what I have seen is that the migrant family may be 10 persons. The family that we perceive to be migrants, 10 persons. Mm -hmm. Of that 10, eight are Belizeans and are the parents both. are migrants. Mm -hmm. So we have to be conscious of that. Yeah. That child may come from a migrant family, but that child has all the rights that you and I do because that child is a Belizean, yeah. right? And so that's, that's important to take into consideration too. And so um, I think as we, I, I heard on one of the shows, people talking about bringing back the, the test for nationality and those kinds of things. And um, I think those are good things. Mm -hmm. I know when I was at immigration, the staff wanted to bring back the tests. And I would hope that at some point in the future it comes back because that would ensure some level of integration. I would agree right? with you because I, oftentimes we speak with, um, with migrants and they know our laws better than most <laughs> Belizeans. And I think it comes with, a, with the fact that they have to know, right? They mm -hmm. have to know um, who to talk to. They have to know the documentations that they need and so forth. So I would imagine that that would be some sort of... Um, I guess, uh, shorts and security for the Belizean mm -hmm. population who are born Belizean. That doesn't right. always make you Belizean. <laughs> born <laughs> Belizean born is Belizean. one thing, but it's a culture on its thing. Exactly. But culture, exactly. that's completely the different. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. but I still do think, I think the, the issue is education helps with stigma. Yes. When yes. people understand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I, and, I, and I use the example very often when explaining the same thing, that we have family members who live in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. exactly. They are migrants. migrants. Um, mm -hmm. We don't think of them that way, but they are. Now, I, I want to come back to, to the migration policy, though, okay. um, because this is really the crucial point. Once we set the policy as to how people are allowed to migrate to the country, who is allowed, what terms, what, whether it is a test or an English course or whatnot, mm -hmm. um, where are we in, in establishing okay. uh, this policy? Well, the, pol the, the program began in 2018 mm -hmm. when they began the work. And in 2019, there were a series of two reports that were done that fed into the preparation for the policy. So um, unfortunately, the project stopped in December, in 2019, December, and it's currently on pause. Um, we at IOM, when I joined in May of 2020, we were trying to get the, po the project moving through the Western Hemisphere program. And we were able to get permission to continue with the cons identifying the consultant to continue the work. And then from there, we um, had the first draft of the migration policy. That came out in December of 2020. So we have shared that with the, with the then new government. And we are now waiting for the government to begin the process. They've indicated they wanted to restart in January. And to restart, we need one to establish the, the um, steering committee, which would be made up of CEOs that are determined by the government. We only act in an advisory and support capacity. This is a process that has to be led by government. Yeah. So um, the, the steering committee needs to be appointed. And then from the steering committee, we need the members of the steering committee and the technical committee to actually look at the first draft of the migration policy to give us their feedback. Mm -hmm. What we have recognized that we will have to do whenever the process restarts, um, the consultant had done a significant amount of interviews with the private sector and different um, non-governmental partners. We feel that because so much has happened in a year, 
that he should go back and have a shorter interview with those persons to see if their views or positions have changed. Yeah. And then he has to focus on doing the interviews within government because that was what was lacking the first time around. And so um, hopefully that process could be completed in the year or within nine months or so. And so hopefully by December, we would be able to have the final draft that would be presented to the government. Now, there can be a policy. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, and everybody thinks it's necessary. The resources to put that policy in place would have to be made a conscious effort to be made to be put those things in place and to f the policy cannot implement itself. So it will have to be driven by the Ministry of Immigration and perhaps I've, we, we've spoken to Jamaica and even at the highest level, the, the, the section that the unit is under the office of the Prime Minister and they have challenges getting it implemented. Hopefully that won't be the case in Belize <laughs> because we are in a different situation. And so um, when the policy is done at the end of this year, hopefully, it's the implementation part of it and, and how government will choose to go about with the implementation. And but meanwhile, we are strongly encouraging all government partners, anybody in the private sector, focus on data yeah. because mm -hmm. data is necessary to make policy decisions. Yeah. I recall when I was at immigration, um, Mrs. Estrada at that time served at the Northern border and she was very good at on the long holiday weekends, cataloging the amount of Belizeans who left the country. That was a staggering number yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's every long holiday weekend. And when you equate the finances to that of people yeah. going out, then that's another story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things that you could look at information, data that would be of interest to the business community, data for health, data for education, data for, for migration decisions. So and we're running out of time so quickly. I do want to get the information in about the amnesty program um, so people can know very clearly whether they um, qualify, how they qualify and what's the process. Um, the government is going to be releasing the requirements and the um, criteria. Well, I think they've already done some of that. Yes. So I think they're going to be putting the final version out. Um, we were in discussions with them yesterday about going out into the community with them to, to inform um, persons in the at the village level um, of what this is all about and sharing the d documentation with them. We have offered to translate that information into Spanish mm -hmm. because that's important. If you put it in English and the migrants are there, um, we're, we're willing to translate it and we're willing to print it to get it out as, as much as we can and to support them in that process. We're also looking at how we can do more co communication with them on that. But basically, there are eight categories that were identified in that process. Um, and so the department has um, gone through and listed all of the requirements under those categories. Again, as I said, we're going to be working at that and we're going to be um, tr translating those into Spanish and trying to help them get it out. But we're committed to try to support them as best as we can um, in the process, to, because if we don't get the information to people and they don't come out, the amnesty is not going to be a success. And then we're going to have the same situation persisting after the end of next year, uh, this year. So it's very important that people come out and, and, um, and, and participate in the, in the amnesty take advantage of it because I'm sure, as I said, the situation will change after the amnesty is over. Yeah. The government will probably begin its enforcement, it's, step up its, its like enforcement activities. It's exactly. Like you may qualify, it's take advantage exactly. now after this. We've, we've been advised that it, it would be a four, a four, and, and I I'm, I'm hope I'm not speaking ahead of time, but and that the immigration authorities will come and they will talk with you to share this information for the public. But we understand that it's going to run from April for a period of four months until the end of July for registration purposes and then the processing for the remainder of the year so it's kind of like a 10 month um, exercise um, we had asked for consideration a little bit longer but they explained why they couldn't mm -hmm. and we understand there's a cost to everything and so um, our objective is to try to reach as many people as we can in the communities to come out to take advantage of this because after this is over we don't know when there'll be another. Uh, we don't want to think about another, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. we would like to know that people are properly documented in the country so that we could reduce the inequalities, we could reduce the vulnerabilities and that sort of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do people get in touch if they want to find out more? Um, we have the hubs and I think we provided yes. you with the slides for, for that information. And so um, we would be having that, um, we, they could call our office, our office is in Belize City, um, 223-9500 is our number. 
And then we have on the screen, we have those, um, those places that, that would be accepting and providing information and accepting, helping people to complete applications. And of course, we are hoping that um, in perhaps in the next month or, or so, in February, sometime in February, we can partner with the, the, the Ministry, of Nationality, Ministry of Immigration, the National and Passport Department that is help leading the amnesty to go into communities to actually help people complete the forms. Yes. What we would like to do is to arrange, when we go into a community, to do a lot of preparation, perhaps take medical, take somebody who takes the photograph, put all the services there so that when they come, they can access those services right at that, that location. And when they leave from there, the application is complete. Mm -hmm. Because the process is that you have to photocopy all the pages of the passport, you have to complete a form, you have to have photographs, all of those things, medical certificates, um, uh, 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 different things that you have to provide birth certificates. So we're hoping to go with the department into the communities at a later date after they've done their, their awareness campaign to go out and provide the actual services. And then they also can be obtained through the hubs, <laughs> right? All right. Well, this is really just the start of this conference. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> There'll yes. be, there will be a lot more information we can be able to, to yeah. Uh, dive into but it really does set the tone and, and help people understand the work that you've been doing and i will tell you quickly about one other project that well two we are currently finishing a project um it ends this month with the migration and climate change and that's the ministry of sustainable development and next week we're going to be launching another project that we got with them um from the lives and dignity foundation um, that will be coming. The, the details will be coming out. It's, it's um, going to be funded by the EU, but we, and there'll be a press release right. next week. But it's a project that will impact five communities in Western Belize. We're hoping that it can be a real big success um, because if it is, we're going to be helping government to look for funding to go replicate that same project in other communities in Belize. It's yeah. looking at drainage, um, w building a polyclinic. Um, hurricanes, up the, up the upgrading hurricane shelters, um, right. training people for fire brigade, getting a water bowser for them to control forest fires. So yeah. that's in those five communities. And so that's another one that we're doing. A whole lot of work <laughs> on yes, going. So we'll be talking exactly. to you more then. We have about seven projects <laughs> going on. <laughs> well, we appreciate you coming in. Um, mm. and, and we saw Pedro's story and there are many more. More, yes, um, there is. That are yet to be told. So. Um, we'll have more information, especially as this program rolls out. Um, I think people are going to need as much information as possible to understand. So thank you for coming in. Thank you. And I hope the media is going to be a good supporter of getting the information <laughs> out there. <laughs> Migrants apparently are into the social media from what the res researches that we've yeah. done. The social media are big on the social media and they're big on the, tele the radio, not so much television. Yeah. So we have to take those things into consideration as we go out and get that information out there. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to be making vegan food. That's right. I'm excited. Stick around and we'll be there.